chapter 28. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 10 in just a little bit. And as we look back at all this time that we've been going through the Gospel of Matthew, maybe it's been a question in your mind. It's like, why are we spending all this time in, in just one book? Well, in reality, by the time we finish in a couple of weeks, we will have studied all of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, a good portion of the Gospel of John, some of the Psalms, some of the book of Revelation, some of the Apocrypha, and even some of Josephus' writings on the historical events of, of the time. And, and as we look at these things, especially the last few weeks and the events that we're going to look at today, and in the next couple of weeks, they really are the dramatic high point in history. Until the Lord returns again, this is the high point. Everything that we have read, everything that we've studied in the book of Matthew has been building up to this moment. You know, the thing that sets Christianity apart from every other religion is that every other founder of faith and their respective religion dead. They died and they're still dead. Confucius, Buddha, Muhammad, Joseph Smith, all these people that are dead. Jesus is not dead. There is a qualitative difference between these faiths. Therefore, we say the resurrection is the cornerstone of the Christian faith. Now, it's ironic that the disciples seemingly at the moment did not understand the many times that Jesus had talked about rising from the dead. Now, his opponents, the Jewish leaders, they knew all too well. They understood exactly what Jesus was saying. Uh, before we go to chapter 28, I want to read to you the, the last part of chapter 27, beginning in verse 62. The next day, on the Sabbath, the leading priests and the Pharisees went to see Pilate. They told him, Sir, we remember what that deceiver once said while he was still alive. He said that after three days, I will rise from the dead. So we request that you seal the tomb until the third day. This will prevent his disciples from coming and stealing his body and then telling everybody he was raised from the dead. If that happens, we'll be worse off than we were at first. Pilate replied, Take guards and secure it the best you can. So they sealed the tomb and they posted guards to protect it. Everything possible was being done to make sure that there were no claims of Jesus rising from the dead. But the schemes of man cannot compare to the power of God. Now the seal likely would have been a long cord that went across the, the, the stone and it was sealed on either side by wax so that if the stone was moved any at all, the seal would be broken. Now, one of the difficulties on the account of the resurrection by, for a lot of people is the differences in the accounts of the Gospels. And it takes a little detective work to put, to put it all together and some people would see the differences in the various Gospels as, as pointing to the, the falsehood of the resurrection. Well, let me tell you, as, as, as spending many years as a detective and, and interviewing a lot of witnesses and a lot of suspects, if, if an account of something was true, if you had three people, you're going to get three different <laughs> stories. Every time something was false, I encountered word for word, the same thing from numerous people. So, as we look at the gospel accounts, the differences argue for the trustworthiness rather than against it. Now, the first thing we learn is that a group of women came to the tomb on the first Easter Sunday. And if you put the various accounts together, it appears that they came as a group to give Jesus a proper burial. There were four women that's named in the, in the synoptic gospels and then in John. There's four of them that's called by name. We've already seen that that, uh, Ma uh, that Matthew mentions, or we will, that Matthew mentions Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, perhaps Jesus' mother, or the mother of James, it says. Mark adds that Salome was part of that, and Luke writes that it was the two Marys, Joanna, and others. Now, 
They were understandably concerned about how they were going to get to the body of Jesus because this huge stone had sealed the tomb. And sometime, either during this journey or prior to their arrival or, or even there, it, it, there's this earthquake that takes place. So let's pick up Matthew's account of Easter morning, chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. Early on Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone, and sat on it. His face shone like lightning, and his clothing was white as snow. The guards shook with fear when they saw him, and they fell into a dead faint. Then the angel spoke to the women. Don't be afraid, he said. I know you are looking for Jesus who is crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead, just as he said would happen. Come and see where his body was lying. And now, go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. Remember what I've told you. The women ran quickly from the tomb. They were very frightened, but also filled with great joy, and they rushed to give the disciples the angel's message. And as they went, Jesus met them and greeted them, and they ran to him, grasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Don't be afraid. Go tell my brothers to leave for Galilee, and they will see me there. So Matthew and Mark tell us about one angel. Luke and John tell us there were two angels present. And once again, that's something that skeptics like to jump on, but, but, but it really isn't a big deal. You see, Matthew and Mark relate the story of, of what one angel said. They, they speak of the one that does the speaking. Luke and John tell us there were two angels present. And, and what happens next is a little confusing as you read the various gospel accounts. So we kind of have to put together a chronological order by piecing them all together. Now, Mary Magdalene may have been sent by the women back to tell the disciples that the body of Jesus was missing. It's possible that the women stood back for a while, gazing at the empty tomb, trying to figure out what was going on. And then as it got more close to daylight, they, they went a little closer to examine and they saw the angels. Now, meanwhile, Mary told Peter and John, and they ran to the tomb. By this time, the other women had left to go back into Jerusalem. Mary lagged behind because she couldn't run as fast as Peter and John. When she arrived at the tomb, Peter and John had already departed to go tell the other disciples what had happened. Mary was standing alone in the garden. When she saw someone, she soon was the gardener. And she asked him, have you moved Jesus by? What have you done with him? But it was Jesus. And when he spoke her name, her eyes were open. She recognized him instantly, and she was overwhelmed with joy. Also, on the journey back to Jerusalem, these women uh, encountered Jesus, and they bowed, and they grabbed his feet. And Jesus sent them back to tell his disciples that they had seen him. Meanwhile, on the road to Emmaus, Jesus appears to two travelers. And then, back at the meeting place of the disciples, the women shared their stories. The men from Emmaus shared their stories. They were in the upper room locked, and Jesus appeared among them. Now, one thing jumps out to me as I read about the first eyewitnesses of the resurrection. Who were they? They were women. Why, does that, why is that a big deal? Well, first, it shows that God does not view women as second-class citizens to men. He created men and women with different gifts and different functions, but one is not more valuable than the other. But it also shows me that, you know, if the disciples were making up the story of Jesus' resurrection, if it was a sham, they would not have said anything about women. They would have said that the first witnesses were men to make it believable in their day and age. So, Next week, or no, the week after next, we're going to talk more about why people resist the truth of the resurrection. 
But today I just want to, to bring you the facts and draw your attention to four commands that we see in this passage or exhortations. Four different exhortations are given to these followers of Christ. Some were from the angel, some are from Christ himself, and I believe that these commands are just as pertinent to us today. And the first is, do not be afraid. Verse 5, the angel said to the women, don't be afraid. I know you're looking for Jesus. He's not here. He's risen from the dead. Then in verse 10, Jesus said, don't be afraid. Now, we can hear that so many times, but what do we do? We get afraid. In our world, it seems like there are a lot of reasons to be afraid. There's violence everywhere. One normal visit to the doctor and, and, and your life can be fear-filled. Financial markets are precarious. Life is uncertain. Even scripture describes life as fleeting. James says that, that it's, it's like a mist. It's here one moment and then it's gone. Death seems to loom over our shoulders. Well, the great message of the resurrection is this. Death can no longer hurt us. Even though we will die physically, if we have placed our faith in Christ, we will live. We don't have to fear death because it's just a temporary thing. It's no longer the end of life. It's simply the end of the beginning of new life. We, we, we still don't like the prospect or the process of death. No one does, but we don't have anything to fear from death itself. You know, when you lose a loved one, it's devastating. There are a lot of fears that flood us at those times. We, we fear that, that maybe their lives will be forgotten, that maybe we'll forget them. We wonder how we're going to make it without that person. We're fearful about it. But the resurrection gives us the promise of reunion. If we are in, in Christ, we will see one another again. Death is no longer goodbye. It's just, I'll see you a little later. And once you come to peace with dying, everything else in life is less threatening. <clears throat> Paul writes, Death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? The resurrection of, of Christ is a fact that you can examine, but it's not just a fact. It's an event that alters every way that we approach and do life. From the way we live today, to the way we handle the death of loved ones, to the way that we face our own mortality. It gives us a reason for hope. And because of that hope, folks, we do not have to be afraid. Don't be afraid. The second command we see is come and see. In verse 6, the, angels told the, the, the angel told the women to, to come and see. He's no longer here. Come and see. Check it out for yourself. The angels invited them to examine the evidence to see for themselves that Jesus was not there. And we are encouraged to do the same thing. Take a good, long look at the evidence of the resurrection. And you don't have to take anyone's word for it. You can look yourself. The resurrection is the cornerstone of our faith. And this is the one, this is something you need to be absolutely sure of and certain about. Look at the evidence. Ask your questions. You see, though we come to Christ in faith, we don't come without evidence. We don't have to be gullible in our approach. Personally, the thing that has helped me the most in times of doubt, and, and I'll be honest, we all have doubts creep in from time to time through our lives, but it, it's the fact that I have looked at the evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and have become convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus really is who Scripture says he is. He really is who he claimed that he was. And no matter what else is going on, no matter what seems to maybe shape my faith, my anchor is in the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. And that proves for me that he was who he said he was, the Son of God who came to save me from my sin, who died on the cross in my stead, who was placed in the tomb and who was raised to life by the power of the Holy Spirit and who lives forevermore. That conviction changes the way that I, that I approach everything else. You see, I'm not merely following a religious figure. I'm not following a religion. I'm not following a denomination. I'm following the only one who can be saved. Not only are we to come and see, 
we should invite others to come and see. Our family, our friends, we should invite them to take a look at the evidence. Tell them to check it out. And there are some good places to go. First and foremost is what? Scripture. That should be our source of truth primarily. But there are other sources that they can go to that back up what Scripture said. I, I talked last week about uh, uh, Lee Strobel in his book, Case for Christ. And if you don't like to read, there's a movie that follows the book along. And it's a good movie. I watched it last week just so I could make sure that it went with the book. And it does. Strobel was an atheist who was trying to disprove that Jesus was who he said he was, that the resurrection was a sham. His, he, was a, he was a journalist, and his wife became a believer. And he didn't like that fact, so he said, I'm going to set out, and I'm going to study the evidence, and I'm going to prove. And she said, only if you do it, like you have done every other investigation. You've got to look at it, and then you've got to tell the truth. Well, the truth smacked him in the head, and he became a believer. Another source is, if you like movies, is God's Not Dead too. There are some great examinations of the evidence of the reliability and the truthfulness of Christ in there. Some simple books that are easy reading and not, and they're free. You can download them for free uh, by Josh McDowell. Evidence that demands a verdict and that, that, that more than a carpenter. It's probably the first book that I ever read on the evidence of, of, of the resurrection. And then there is a, a, a man named J. Warner Wallace. He was a cold case detective who was a non-believer, who was an atheist. And he set out to look at the cold case of the resurrection. And, and he looked at the evidence, and he is a believer. And then there's a book by Rice Brooks, Man, Myth, Messiah. It, it's good for you to be aware of the evidence so that you can direct others in their pursuit of truth. Scripture primarily, but then give them some other sources. So, don't be afraid. Come and see. And the third one is, go and tell. In verse 10, the women are told to go and tell the disciples. At the end of the Gospel of Matthew, we'll see in a couple weeks that Jesus tells his disciples to go into all the world and tell. Now, if the message of Easter is true, if the resurrection of Christ is true, and I believe with all my heart that it is because I've looked at the evidence, then that is the best and the most important news that there is to share. The truth is God is real, that God cares, that life is not meaningless, that we do have purpose, and that forgiveness is possible, and that there is life beyond the grave. And in reality, every day of your life, you will come in contact with someone who is longing to hear at least one of those truths, one of those messages of hope. We should be shouting this news from the rooftops. Just because we are familiar with the story of, the, of Easter and the resurrection doesn't mean that everybody is. We wrongly assume that everyone has at least some understanding of the message of Easter, but they don't. And it might sound trivial, but in reality, a lot of people are confused about it. For Easter, Easter for them, is something entirely different. It's a time filled with bunnies and eggs and candy and family gathering, and there's nothing wrong with all those things, but those are not Easter. So, somebody needs to tell them. We need to tell them that Easter is not a holiday, that Easter is a historical event that changed everything. It's not a celebration designed by Cadbury or Peeps. It is God breaking through the walls of death and futility, giving us hope and new life and new direction. Who can you tell today? Who do you know that needs the message of Easter? Whenever we talk about our faith, we should move the conversation to that point every time, to this event, to our risen Savior. This is the pivotal event, which is the cornerstone of what we believe. And then the last command. Remember what I told you. The angel said, all this, he's gone. He's not here. He's gone on. Tell him to go meet him. Remember what I told you. We need to remember the story of Easter. We need to recall it. Whenever we feel overwhelmed with life and we wonder, you know, what is the use? We need to remember the Easter story. Whenever we feel defeated and, 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 you know, when we don't think that there's any way out, 
We need to remember the Easter story. When we stare death in the face and we feel the anxiety of an unknown future staring back at us, we need to remember that Christ is risen. When we stand at a freshly dug grave and we wonder, how in the world am I going to make it without my loved one? We need to remember the resurrection story. When we are talking with a friend who has no hope, we need to be able to recall the message of Easter, what the angel said about Jesus and what we know to be true. We must remember the resurrection of Jesus because it gives us a whole new starting point and an ending point for this life. Easter must never be a one-day celebration. It must become the fuel for our daily living. Start each day with a reminder that because he lives, my future is certain. Because he lives, he's got this day. No matter what I face, it will not change the fact that Jesus Christ is risen and reigns and lives forevermore. And through him, I'll do the same. I'm an Easter person. I guess the greatest compliment that's ever been shared uh, to me from the Board of Ordained Ministry, I had to go to Gastonia and sit in with them one time and, and talk to them for about three hours and, and they could throw out any question they want. And this one woman's question was, what is your view on the doctrine of the resurrection? And I said, here we go. And I led into her, telling her what it meant to me, and what I thought and what I believed. And she said, my, you are an Easter person. I'm like, yes, yes I am. That is what fuels me. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. It, it, it's not because Easter is a day that, that brings a lot of people to church, which is it's good for, for a pastor to see the church full. That's not what it's about. The resurrection gives my life passion. The truth of Jesus' return from the death has convinced me that, that, that he is the one worth following. That I have put all my eggs into the right basket. What about you? Have you ever looked carefully at the resurrection of Christ? Or do you simply sit in the pew year after year and hear the truth but never allow it to make that impact on your life? Have you considered the evidence? Or have you merely accepted the what somebody else has said about it, either for or against the resurrection. And, and you know, you say, you say, well, nobody here would ever believe that the resurrection is false. Well, on Wednesday evening, I sat around the table with 16 youth. And as statistics would show, inside the church and outside the church, about 40% of those kids, which is not just a kid thing, statistics show that over 40% uh, I mean, that, that, that less than 40% of churchgoers believe in an absolute truth. That's where we have gone in this country in the last 40 to 50 years. No absolute truth. This is the one thing in your spiritual walk that's way too important to be haphazard about. You cannot be lackadaisical in your approach to the resurrection. If these things are true, then, hey, folks, there is a God. There is life beyond the grave. Jesus is that way to life. Life doesn't have, uh, we just don't float around on a breeze. We are here for a purpose, a reason. There is a thing, such a thing as the absolute truth. And listen, folks, that truth is not the United Methodist Church. That truth is not the Baptist Church. That truth is not anything else. It is a person in the name of Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God, who did go to the cross, who bore your sins on his back, and who endured the wrath of God, who was dead, who was placed in a tomb, and who was resurrected by the power of God Almighty and through him we have sure and certain resurrection from physical death into life eternal. That is the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other way. Amen. Amen. So let's get that fact straight. There is an absolute truth. And what is needed is a relationship with the one who is the truth. If you want to outlive this thing called death, then you better believe that Jesus is the only way. Jesus is still alive, and he wants to lead into forgiveness and into new life. 
He wants his sacrifice to apply to your rebellion, to your sins. And he wants his resurrection to stand up within you and bring you into that life eternal. And the way that this happens is for you to recognize that you need it. That in your living you have ignored him. You have turned your back on the truth. And that you have run from him. You need to recognize that and turn to that truth, run to him, and live into what he has for you. Christ invites you to come to him, allow him to be Lord, allow him to cleanse you, to remake you, and finally to resurrect you when you die from this physical realm. If you have not done that, today is the day you should take care of that. Now, I'm reaching the point in my life where I'm prone to tell the same stories over and over not a new splash to a lot of you. Uh, I have been blessed to be able to be here with you for so many years, and, and you know a lot of my stories, uh, and I love to tell them. Some of you might even be able to tell some of my stories as if they were your own stories. And I don't think I'm alone in that boat. We, we all have life stories that we share, that we tell over and over through the years, and they have become a way for us to share our lives with others. Here's the thing. If we're going to recount something again and again and again, if we're going to tell the story again and again, why not make it something worth telling? Why don't we recount the, the story of the empty tomb, the story that matters the most? Why not look for opportunities to share the great news of the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Let's share the transforming nature of Easter. This is one of those stories that truly is sweeter every time that you tell it. And every time we tell it, we find that it is exactly the story that not only we most need to hear, but that other people most need to hear. Because it is the story that has the greatest impact on our lives, both here and in the life to come. Tell others. The story of Jesus. Tell them about, about the birth of Christ, about how God was wrapped in flesh and, and, and became man. But don't dare stop there. Don't dare stop at teaching or telling someone about the stories of Jesus when he was alive, but tell them about his death. Tell them about the tomb. Tell them about the resurrection and how you have examined this truth and that you know the truth and that truth has set you free into a new creation that you are one who are in the truth, that even though you might die physically, you will be raised to be with him. Somebody's eternal destination might just depend upon your step of faith to dare to share the truth with them. Let's stand and sing our closing hymn because he lives.